The events of Noah's Flood are laid out in scripture. Though different theories exist on exactly how the event occurred, the problem I see is that the theories are so busy competing with one another that they lack the ability to see how well they work in conjunction with one another. In this video, you will see a conglomeration of many models which together all take care of the potential issues that critics might bring forward. The story of Noah's Flood exists around the world. Cultures and people everywhere have told stories of it. But rather than just use that as evidence, let's use physical evidence instead. Here's the question. According to Genesis, the Garden of Eden was a lush paradise, one for eternal life, worldwide vegetarianism, and complete harmony with our creator, mankind, and the beast of the field. There was no bloodshed, disease, or even death. Neither plants nor trees even had thorns or thistles. Man was created to live forever. It was only sin that brought death into the world and broke apart this harmony. This is what is referred to as the Fall. We disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. From that time and on, sickness, death, and disease has entered the world, mutations building up every generation, leading slowly to man's demise. All the while, people blaming God for cancer, while it was man's rebellion that led to this. The universe and Earth itself began to decay. And within just 2,000 years after the fall of man, humanity had turned so corrupt and so wicked that God sent the flood as a judgment against us. For God saw that the wickedness of man was great, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God instructed Noah to make an ark, a word that means box or chest, to specific dimensions, materials, and construction. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah and his family entered the ark, along with two of every kind of land animal. And then, in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month and the seventeenth day of the month, the fountains of the great deep broke forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. These two events occurring began the first day of a series of events that changed the history of Earth and mankind itself. Giant rifts or tears ran thousands of miles across the planet. This is where the fountains of the great deep broke forth, jetting it into the atmosphere, along with massive amounts of stones and debris from the Earth's crust. All of these things would have been bombarding the canopy that surrounded the Earth, reflecting them back into the Earth's surface, causing even more destruction and turmoil. Until eventually, one of the projectiles would be strong enough to fracture and break apart the firmament. global rain. The moon itself bears witness of this, as the moon does not rotate, yet what faces us shows clear evidence of bombardment from the very projectiles shot out from the earth during the flood. And we also have evidence for this as well. Ask yourself, where was Earth's oldest rock found? That's right, it was found on the moon during the Apollo mission. The evidence that the global flood brought on the Ice Age is abundant. One such example 
is rapid freezing. Reports describe the apparent near-instant freezing of a flowing river found buried in the frozen ground with fish frozen in place. Rivers do not freeze instantly, they freeze from the top down. The ice insulates the flowing water below, which prevents complete freezing. Here's another great report. 50 oxen were found, trapped in a remote frozen river. They were found attempting to cross when the river froze instantly. It froze them in place, alive, and they were unable to escape. How could a river freeze so quickly that a large powerful animal could not exit in time? An entire herd of them. And what were they running from? Other findings in the Arctic also indicate rapid freezing. You see, it was a lush temperate region, not a frozen wasteland from an ice age that was lasting thousands of years. The evidence for this is everywhere. Baron Axel Heiberg Island and Ellsmore Islands have been discovered to harbor a vast array of temperate animals and vegetation, which are now buried under the snow. Note that some animals recovered are burrowing animals that could not dig into rock-hard permafrost. Others are cold-blooded. Large trees were also found. Even more recently, giant camels have been found up in the north as well. In fact, Vast frozen non-fossilized forests that once thrived in the now barren Arctic Circle continue to surface as summer runoff erodes and releases the timber from the frozen muck, driftwood of large non-native trees released from the seafloor still washes up on the shores of remote islands north of Siberia. Northward flowing rivers erode the muck below and see driftwood collect along their shores as it is carried out to sea because there are almost no trees growing now at these latitudes. The natives use these trees for fuel and building material and for burning. Oil drilling in northern Alaska commonly penetrates what is described as a flattened, unfossilized forest under hundreds of feet of frozen muck. There is a glaring problem with this. The frozen trees are not native to the Arctic. These tree species only grow in comparative forest thousands of miles to the south, where it is tropical and warm, proving that this region was also tropical and warm before the flood hit. But the problem is more than just the cold temperatures. These trees need a certain amount of sunlight just to live, and these latitudes do not provide sunlight for these trees to ever have grown. Even if the temperatures were right, there is a reason that these trees show such barren landscapes. Trees do not do well there. The Antarctic also reveals similar evidence that the climate was much warmer. Large deposits of coal and oil indicate large forests and life lived there at one time. Dinosaur fossils also indicate warmer climate. Remember, these indications of rapid and permanent freezing of temperate to tropical flora and fauna are spread over two continents, and the type of flora recovered could never grow at the extreme latitudes they are found in. So simple climate change cannot account for what we observe. Therefore, any theory must explain how these plants grew and how they received the solar light from the sun to support them. The evolutionary theory fails 100% in this area. Only the global flood theory provides an answer to this. So how did it get so cold so fast during the late summer? If the poles were warm, what happened? How did plants get sunlight? How did it stay cold for hundreds of years? The answer to the first question is cold hail. During the early stages of the flood, as the fountains of the great deep burst forth and shot water high above the atmosphere, some of the water laden with sediment soon froze as it radiated heat into super cold space. Above the atmosphere, temperatures are well below negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. When the water reached this area, these frozen droplets were super cooled well below normal freezing and were transformed into muddy hail which fell back down, blanketing vast areas in thick blankets of extremely cold hail. These warm climates were quickly transformed in hours. The dense sediments trapped in the hail caused it to sink to the bottom of any of the bodies of water on the earth. 
the heat from even flowing rivers were quickly absorbed by this super cold hail and some rivers froze from the bottom up trapping fish and crossing animals quickly frozen in place so muddy hail can explain the extreme cold well what about the woolly mammoth we're told that these were arctic creatures evolved for the cold let's remove fact from fiction shall we the fiction is that they lived in a cold arctic climate and that's what they evolved for what does their dna show that they're related to the indian elephant they say that they have a layer of fat for warmth yet fat is only indicated from abundance of food supply they don't have blubber they have fat like humans do a subcutaneous layer of fat and it goes up based on what we eat not where we live the mammoth so-called wool is nothing but hair just like on an ape do apes live in the tropics or do they live in the frozen tundra the answer should be obvious when a fluid expands it cools greatly any remaining heat that was left over after the fountains of the great deep projected water into the upper atmosphere and turned it to ice would have been dumped into space because space is the perfect heat sink the great speeds at which the fountains flow mean that there would be little time for heat transfer with the atmosphere as it raced past even with some steam formation noah was located far away from the mid-atlantic ridge anyway so the hot air near any fountain would have dissipated far before reaching him because air is a very poor conductor of heat let me explain consider that after you pass earth's atmosphere temperature plummets to negative 150 degrees fahrenheit and lower so any air that would be beside the fountains that was heated and pulled up with the flow would have a tendency to lose speed fall away and radiate any gained heat long before it flowed back down another thing to consider is that as the canopy collapsed during the flood the atmosphere now would be expanding causing a cooling worldwide effect including reduction in air pressure and worldwide rain holding down a button on a can of hairspray you can feel the can getting cooler so expanding the air would reduce the temperature of the earth and negate any effects of rising temperature and also consider the canopy was only 9 miles up not 60 where the top of the atmosphere is today so the numbers that people were throwing around is all moot and in reality the numbers actually do show that they can be shot up 60 miles next tectonic shifting caused massive mud filled tsunamis to speed across deep ocean floors then on the shallow ocean floors killing everything in their path the first mega sequence wipes out mostly shallow marine habitats Fossils show that the first three mega sequences buried the shallow seas that were filled with marine life, as these deposits have almost no trees or land animals in them. Yet we know that all three mega sequences covered similar environments across North and South America, including Africa, the three continents mapped so far. Another significant lesson was taken from the Japan tsunami of 2011 published in the Journal of Marine Geology. Though the area with the highest record tsunami waves of 20 meters was just west of Kasinima Bay, the sand that these huge waves deposited on land was still only a mere 30 centimeters thick. 20 days after the horrible tsunami hit the port, emergency surveys were conducted in the bay to make sure that ships were able to enter. The initial survey did verify that ships could safely transit in the bay, but they made an unexpected discovery. Large sand dunes had been formed by the tsunami in the seabed. The dunes were typically six feet high, 20 meters long, in water 15 meters deep. They refer to these underwater dunes as sand waves. Older geologists specifically argue that sand waves cannot form quickly, nor in fast currents. Therefore, they can get away with saying that sand waves found in the geologic column represents deep time. And that way, they can exclude a watery catastrophe, especially on the scale of a global flood. We see multiple surprises. Not only did sand waves form fast, with a fast current, they formed in surprisingly deep water. So 
every assumption that evolutionists make is completely wrong with the observable evidence. So sand wave formation can be made during a global flood. So now, all these things that these evolutionists have said debunked the global flood are now confirmation of Noah's flood. Then, by the 40th day of the flood, this is when the Absorica mega sequences began hitting. The map showed that this is when things became much worse. This is when all of the land masses start to be submerged by the flood waters. Rather than the conventional model that has the seafloor spreading slowly, this runaway subduction actually happened quickly, moving at about 5 miles per hour as the diving ocean plates subducting under the land they push down the continental edges and then release them, creating tsunami cycles that blanket the continents. Exactly the same how tsunamis today happen, but only more intense and frequent. For example, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan was a magnitude 9.1 that occurred in 2011. This earthquake was caused by an undersea megathrust about 45 miles east of the Japanese coast. At the center, there was a 160-foot slip between the overriding plate that was part of Japan and the underlying Pacific plate. The sea bottom rose about 23 feet when the vault unlocked, and the resulting earthquake triggered a devastating tsunami that was 133 feet above sea level and traveled inland for about 6 miles. The tsunamis occurring during the flood, however, were much different with the ocean ridge bursting open rapidly and pushing the ocean floor under land continents on a worldwide scale, tsunamis were happening in cycles, several every hour, and with long stretches of subduction zones active at the same time. The incoming phase of a tsunami has a much higher speed and is highly turbulent, which keeps the sediment in suspension, but it leaves behind layers of sediment as it slows down in the retreating phase this cycle repeats several times every hour during the first 40-day inundation period of the flood. First, entombing the shallow marine life, followed by land creatures in different habitats and elevations, leaving behind what we see today in the fossil record. These types of tsunamis have even occurred in recent history, such as the tsunami caused by slipping ocean plates that hit the coast of Washington in 1700 and left behind multiple layers representing each wave of the tsunami. Recent seismic technology actually allows us to investigate whether this type of rapid subduction occurred. Sure enough, these scans reveal a ring of unexpectedly cold rock at the bottom of the mantle beneath the subduction zones. And while the evidence shows that this rapid subduction occurred, critics still have a problem with the heat generated from this. So let's answer this now. What I believe they just don't understand is that while subduction is occurring quickly, heat from this friction is being produced. They consider this the heat problem. However, what they don't realize is that because the icy hail that brought on this ice age and global reduction of temperatures, freezing lakes, and reducing the ocean's temperature greatly, the heat generated would not be a problem whatsoever. The oceans would have absorbed this heat easily. It would be like pouring liquid lava into your pool it would do nothing to change the temperature of that pool. The severity and elevation of this stage of the flood is why the first land creatures and plants start showing up in the fossil record, laid down by the Absorica mega sequence. Entire ecosystems are buried in enormous deposits that later turn into coal, such as the extensive Appalachian coal beds. In fact, the U.S. has over 7 trillion tons of coal reserves. But where did it come from? While we know that dead plant material being sandwiched between sediments is the cause, we know that we don't have enough vegetation on the earth to produce that much. This proves that the pre-flood world was mostly covered by lush vegetation and the rising flood waters and tsunamis were necessary to sweep over the lands and cover this vegetation to form the coal that we now see in this world today. 
Noah's Flood is the only explanation. The fact that over a dozen states in the United States are filled with dinosaur fossils buried under heaps of mud also attests to the Flood. In fact, geologists have found a temporarily exposed dinosaur peninsula where the dinosaurs made their last stand, now buried there along with lake and sea life, transported by the massive waves that they could not outrun. The earlier flood deposits, the first three mega sequences, do not seem to have deposited much material. Only a few hundred yards of sediment remain, and in many places, no deposition is left at all. Deposits thousands of feet thick occur east and west of this temporarily exposed peninsula that extends from Minnesota all the way down to New Mexico. Now buried across it are pre-flood wet plants and animals, including dinosaurs, turtles, frogs, fish, and many birds. Thousands of dinosaur trackways up and down this peninsula, plus similar temporarily exposed low areas of other continents, prove that dying dinosaurs and other hardy track makers were fighting for their life, wading through heavy mud and sediments and water that was rising to try and kill them. Another piece of evidence, we have what was called a dinosaur stampede of fossil footprints in Australia, presumed to have been made on land. The tracks were recently reinterpreted to have been made in water, with many of the tracks being made by swimming dinosaurs. The report came out in the January 8th Journal of Vertebrae Paleontology, documenting a fossil site in Western Australia where many of the tracks are nothing more than scratch marks from what was obviously a dinosaur being buoyed up by the water, clawing at the dirt as it swam along. This is one of many tracks found there and around the world. But all dinosaur tracks have water somewhat involved. Every single one of the dinosaur track sites were made in what best can be described as tidal flats. Jenny McGuire and Deborah Mickelson of Colorado University at Boulder presented a paper at the 2005 GSA documenting what appeared to be a trail of dinosaur tracks from a dinosaur walking and getting buoyed up by the water, more and more losing contact with the seafloor. However, the drawing that they depicted is not the reality of what happened whatsoever. This is more evolutionist storytelling and blatant lies to your face. The fossil footprints are in the middle of a series of rock layers. According to Steno's statigraphic principles laid out in the 1600s and still adhered to today, it would be assumed that those layers were laid down horizontally. This wasn't some seashore. The principles of initial horizontality, strata either perpendicular to the horizon or inclined to the horizon were at one time parallel to the horizon, and nobody disagrees with this. Therefore, these tracks were not made by some dinosaur walking into the sea, but rather the dinosaur was on flat ground in what is called a tidal flat, and as the dinosaur was happily walking along, the water came in and buoyed up the dinosaur until it lost contact with the ground. This is powerful evidence that Noah's flood was true, not some dinosaur as they portray walking into the sea, especially in light of the fact that other dinosaur tracks were found in that area that were not swimming, meaning they outran the flood waters in that area, as where this one did not. There's more evidence for this in Glen Rose, Texas, the late Cretaceous rock of Glen Rose, Texas, famous today for its so-called human footprints with dinosaur tracks, that layer is acknowledged by the evolutionary community as a tidal flat. Except that huge tidal flat covers a huge portion of North America. That layer has countless clam burrows from clams that were obviously buried alive catastrophically by mud Dinosaurs walked in that mud, more layers were laid down during the tidal waves, then the clams attempted to burrow their way out through those layers. The clams are found by the millions, possibly billions, all buried alive in the closed position, just a few layers above the dinosaur footprints. 
Now tell me, do you think that that was accomplished over millions of years, or a giant water catastrophe? The evidence is best explained, and I would dare say only explained, by Noah's flood. Then the massive Zuni mega sequence hits. The Absorica and Zuni mega sequences are the most severe because the continental plates began to move more quickly from the original Pangaea like supercontinent configuration to where they are today, with oceanic rifting and plate subduction increasing dramatically and the continents traveling apart quickly, the tsunami-like waves began washing across the western North America while virtually no sedimentation is occurring in the east. When coming up over the Dinosaur Peninsula, the Zuni catastrophically buried dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation, a 13-state area encompassing over 700,000 square miles. This Jurassic unit includes at least 141 massive dinosaur bone graveyards, where dinosaurs like the Tamarosaurus, Diphoticus, Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Allosaurus are found. The Cretaceous layers like the Hill Creek Formation are found on top of the Jurassic and holds hundreds of mass boneyards containing several different types of dinosaurs such as the Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, Centrosaurus, and Amontosaurus that had been living in different ecosystems, yet all buried by the Zuni mega sequence. The Zuni was so massive and fast that it engulfed entire regions with mud, burying giant creatures like this Tyrannosaurus rex under 50 feet of mud. It was entombed so quickly that it preserved blood cells, blood vessels, and bone cells. Ask yourself, how much water does it take to bury a living Tyrannosaurus rex under 50 feet of mud? The Dinosaur National Monument in Utah contains thousands of visible bones from 11 kinds of dinosaurs that were buried in a jumbled mass in the Morrison Formation together with crocodiles, turtles, frogs, clams, and lizards. Again, ask yourself what type of event would cause different land animals with millions of clams all to be buried in the same area. When the Dinosaur Peninsula floods over completely, large herds of dinosaurs are entombed in massive fossil graveyards in the Upper Cretaceous System found in northern Wyoming, Montana, and Alberta, Canada. The dinosaurs had tried to escape by fleeing north as waters advanced from the south, explaining this massive graveyard in northern Montana that's over 1.2 miles long and contains 30 million fossil fragments, representing over 10,000 adult myosaur that were simultaneously buried. In this entire collection of bones, not a single baby was ever found. That's right, every single one of these 10,000 myosaurus were between 9 and 23 feet long. This proves that the adult dinosaurs were fleeing for their lives and left their young behind. Just 170 miles northeast of this location is one of the largest dinosaur graveyards in the world, one that even secular scientists admit that was caused by a watery catastrophe. Thousands of centrosaurs that are buried in 14 mega bone beds over an entire square mile which is nearly 500 football fields. The massive herd of these creatures, thousands of them, were simultaneously buried in mud by Noah's flood. Just 45 miles west from this location is yet another massive flood deposit, and this one even has 49 different species of dinosaurs in it, buried along with turtles, crocodiles, fish, flying reptiles, birds, and small mammals. What type of disaster could bury nearly 50 different species that would never be near each other, and many other types of animals, including marine life, all together in mass graves? These mass burial sites are common in the United States. For example, at this dinosaur dig site in Wyoming, where a one meter thick layer of mudstone stretches for 80 acres with over a million bones buried, in a graded, sordid bed where big bones are found at the bottom and little bones are found on top. The only way to develop a graded bed like this is by a catastrophic process that transports these bones and deposits them during a single event. Large flying creatures like pterodactyls were able to fly to escape the rising floodwaters, delaying their demise until the later stages of the flood. 
the fossil record shows that they are buried in many different layers all over the world. Widespread volcanism was also involved in finishing off the dinosaurs, as many of these massive graves are literally packed with volcanic ash that in many cases was mixed with water when it encapsulated the dinosaurs in their tombs. One section of the Morris Information, called the Brushy Basin Member, spreads across five states and includes over 4,000 cubic miles of volcanic materials without a single volcano in the Morrison Formation. Geologists believe this material had to be carried all the way from volcanoes on the west coast. Volcanoes that were created by the magma rising from the subducting ocean crusts plunging under the land. Today, these subduction zones form the Ring of Fire, responsible for over 90% of our earthquakes. The Bible records that on the 150th day of the flood, God made a wind to pass over the earth. The water started to recede. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Now enters the final mega sequence, the Tejas. Here, after the water peaked over the top of the highest mountains of the pre-flood world, they began to rush off the continents, eroding and reworking some of the deposits laid down in the previous mega sequences, especially carving away at the Zuni deposits. This final sequence appears to be different than the others because there was a reversal in flow direction as the waters began to sheet off of the continents. This flow reversal transported much of the fossils deposited earlier off the highest uplands, spreading them towards the edges of the continents, and the evidence points to the Tejas draining the flood waters southward off of the U.S. towards the Gulf of Mexico with a sheet wash pattern all at once. This is why we find massive sand deposits in the deep water off the Gulf of Mexico. Billions of barrels of oil have been discovered there, with much of it found within a massive 1,100 foot thick bed of pure sand in over 7,000 feet of water over 200 miles offshore. In addition, plants swept off the pre-flood land formed massive coal beds, such as in the Power River Basin of Wyoming and Montana. These Tejas layers contain the largest coal deposits in North America that currently supply over 40% of the coal in the United States. Some of these stacked coal beds are up to 200 feet thick and areas that are over 60 miles long by 60 miles wide. The sheer volume of plant material required to form such a massive layer of coal testifies to catastrophic circumstances. The massive runoff that began with the Tejas may also explain the lack of human fossils in the rock record. Any residual human remains left buried and earlier deposits were totally destroyed by the erosive retreating flood waters in line with God's promise to wipe man from the face of the earth. Any residual remains were ground up and spread in all directions over great distances by the Tejas, lessening the likelihood of finding any human fossil remains. Because humans were impacted earlier on by the flood's violence, erosion in the Tejas sequence would have affected the strata beneath, wiping away even traces of human remains buried in earlier layers. This is also why we hardly find any primate fossils. They're extremely rare. Matter of fact, the first one to ever be found was in 2005, and it was just a few teeth. When God stopped the fountains of the Great Deep on day 150, the new ocean surface began cooling, allowing floodwaters to lower as they sheeted off the continents into the new ocean basins. Psalms 104 describes the mountains being raised at the end of the flood, and the waters draining down the valleys and off the new land surfaces. The seafloor rifting process and the resulting mounting forming process explains why sea creatures are found on mountaintops all over the world, high above current sea levels. For the remaining 220 days of the flood, the water recedes from the earth and it dries out, allowing time for the earth to be replenished, with vegetation for the animals to eat when they eventually come off the ark. This year-long catastrophe left behind a vast number of proofs that, quite frankly, make its occurrence obvious. First, we have the staggering volume of fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks around the world, over one mile thick on average, including billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. 
and the sediment that they are found in lies above sea level. What sort of water process could place so much sediment above sea level, on top of the land surfaces? Another clue is the vast horizontal extent of individual sediment layers, with little or no erosional channeling between successive layers. What sort of transport and depositional process could conceivably generate such uniform layers over such vast horizontal distances? Many of these layered beds are separated by bedding planes on the scale of inches to feet, a feature so common that if you stop to think about how it happened, it's as if the sediment is being deposited in pulses in a repeating manner, with each pulse producing a thin layer commonly found around the world. The flood tsunamis provide this perfect explanation, and it happens so quickly there was no time between the deposition layers for surviving critters to burrow into the ground and turn them over. This is known as bioturbation. This is another major problem for long-scale evolution. You see, when living creatures burrow into the ground, they leave behind evidence that they did this. Traces that we should be able to see. These geologic layers of supposed ecosystems should be filled with evidence of bioturbation. Yet the evidence is not there, proving that these layers are not even hundreds of years old, let alone millions. The matter of fact, there was not enough time between each layer forming for these burrowing creatures to perform this task. You see, if each layer was an ecosystem and represents thousands or millions of years, then the evidence of bioturbation would be everywhere worldwide. But since we see no evidence of burrowing creatures between these layers, this proves two things. It proves that these layers were not laid down slowly over long periods of time. And two, it proves that it was laid down quickly during the flood of Noah when tsunamis were striking rapidly, exactly like the new physical evidence shows. When we look close at the fossil record, we see layers containing mass fossil graveyards and mass burial of catastrophic proportions. Remember, the flood started in the ocean. This is why we see the fossil record laid out like it is, with bottom-dwelling ocean life on the bottom and higher land animals on top. This is why we also find fossilized trilobite trails in layers supposedly millions of years older than the actual trilobite that made the trail. Let that sink in for a moment. So basically, all that happened were these trilobites were running up as the mud was flowing in, wave after wave from the tsunami, and they were leaving behind their prints as they died in the higher layers, not able to outrun the mud. And this is down the line. We find fossil bird prints before we find fossils of birds. We find fossil prints of dinosaurs before we find dinosaurs. Here are fossil footprints of an amphibian, but the only date they find amphibian fossils in are 15 million years later, higher up in the fossil record. Think about it. Trilobites, coral, clams, brachiopods, they would be the first to die because they can't escape. For example, when we go to the Grand Canyon and we look at fossil stromatolites, they're in the layers below the flood rocks. So we are not surprised to find that some of the domes are stacked up in a linear structure that look like a reef. There was an ancient reef system that made these slime mats building these domes that protected a lagoon near the coast of the pre-flood continent similar to how they do today. When the flood came, it buried that pre-flood reef and fossilized it perfectly, and it buried the creatures that were in that lagoon before the waters rose up to cover the continents. Again, we see evidence of quickly buried history. We find fossilized raindrops, ripples from water, footprints going through geological layers of time that would be impossible if these layers were laid down over millions of years. All of this evidence proves Noah's flood, not million years of evolution. You see, Charles Lyell invented the geologic column not because of the evidence, but because he had a clear agenda to do so. In his words, it was to free the science of Moses. Even Darwin acknowledged the inconsistencies of geology. He admitted not seeing what should be expected everywhere. 
Stephen J. Gould admitted the same thing in 1980. This is well over 100 years after Darwin admitted the same thing. To their dismay, David Ralph agreed. He stated, well, we know we are now about 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky, and ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transitions than we had in Darwin's time. Just lining things up on a table and telling a story is probably fun, especially for kids, but that's not science. The Grand Canyon is a great example for anybody to look at because it was fractured open, perhaps by an earthquake, and we can now see the layers easily. There is virtually no erosion features between the layers when they are inspected. Also, you will notice layers have eroded flat. Flat is not how ecosystems exist. We find no fossils of death in pre-flood rock layers because no catastrophic event took place to preserve them. It's only when we get to the great unconformity that life is visible in the fossil record. We can see the flood layer when we look around the world. Here it is at the Grand Canyon. It is referred to as the Tapit Sandstone. Here is a map where you can trace it across North America. So, what do the rock layers show? Ocean waters flooded over all the continents. Evidence for this is obvious in that there are marine fossils on the top of all mountains on Earth. There is widespread, rapidly deposited rock layers. These rock layers can be traced all the way across continents and between them. This is evidence of a worldwide global event, not random ecosystems buried over eons of time. Even museums today acknowledge that dinosaur graveyards, marine life, trees, and more were all buried quickly by a catastrophic water event. The fossil layers are 100% evidence of Noah's Flood. Lake Titicaca rests at 12,500 feet above sea level today, and its fresh water have ocean aquatic life, such as seahorses, alive in it today, which are only ever found in the ocean. So, this is more physical evidence, yet again, of remnants from the worldwide flood. We can test the age of a lake another way, using observable rates other than the assumption of slow continental uplift, by what we call residence time. That is, the time it takes for water to be flushed from the lake and replaced by new water. It's also called lake retention time. It is the measurement of the age of the water within the lake. For example, this figure is the result of dividing the lake volume by the flow in and out of the lake. It expresses the amount of time taken for a substance introduced into a lake flow and out of it again, in this case, salt. And for Lake Titicaca, the residence time is around 1,343 years, not even close to millions of years that they assume and tell the public. The fact is, Lake Titicaca was raised from sea level during Noah's flood and was flooded with the ocean water during that time. The surrounding land attests to this but more on that next. Evidence from this is that Lake Titicaca drains to the south along Altapolano Tableland, spreading out over the Desagudero and towards Lake Upo, and from there into large salt flats, proving that Lake Titicaca was once ocean water, as these salt flats are the basin from which Lake Titicaca flows. If what I'm saying is true, that the floodwaters pushed ocean water into Lake Titicaca, then its drainage of salt would be quite noticeable in the downstream of the current lake's outflow, which it is. It's all along the Altapolano to the south, where it is accumulated along the slightly sloping tableland, which drops 400 feet from Lake Titicaca. Although Altapolano and around Lake Hupo lies the Salar de Yuani, where even more salt is found. The last 4,300 years since the flood, the lake has been draining and losing salt and exchanging it for fresh water from rain and new rivers flowing into it, leaving the lake today mostly fresh water. Salt content is nearly all gone, but yet some still remains, proving that the lake is young and not millions of years old. It's impossible. We creationists know that it was filled with seawater during the time of the flood. 
and pushed into its current position during the formation of the Andes because of two tests. One is of its drainage basins, which prove it was once completely salt water. Two, it has salt water flora and fauna in and around the lake with millions of fossil seashells on its shores. As you should know, water always finds the lowest recesses of ground and eventually settles. This lake is in a deep pit which the water settled in after the flood receded. It's the only explanation that fits the evidence we see. And we also have evidence of a 1,000 year old temple beneath the waters of the Lake Titicaca. An international group of archaeologists say that there is evidence of a temple 200 meters long and 50 meters wide, along with signs of a paved road. What other event deposits ocean water and aquatic life at 12,500 feet above sea level? You see, only theory evolution has for this is that the land must have been lifted up from sea level very slowly over millions of years, but their rescuing device for this fails because this supposed continental uplift puts this occurrence before humans supposedly evolved. You see, the gradual process of plate tectonics is so slow for the ground to lift 12,500 feet from sea level, the numbers just don't add up. But wait, what about the seahorses? How can seahorses adapt so quickly to such a new environment right after the flood? The answer lies in their genes. They lack or lost many of the genes which would have caused them to die otherwise. This is why we don't see a lot more ocean life in that lake today. They were unable to adapt to the salt content changing to fresh water. Puma Punku is in Bolivia. It is a perfect example of an antediluvian structure that we can see today. At 13,000 feet elevation, it's a South American ruin that predates the Mayans. This massive structure, with its advanced stonework, was destroyed in a flood. First of all, for a flood to reach 13,000 feet elevation is pretty incredible. Next, for a flood to move these megaton blocks and bury them in over 8 feet of mud is even more astounding. As you can see, many blocks are still covered to this day. Who knows how much is hidden from sight. The flood was so powerful that it not only buried this city, but was able to break apart these stones, and some of them were moved, weighing 131 metric tons. Since no rivers flow into Lake Titicaca, which is the nearest water source to Pumapunku, the only explanation for the submerged ruins by scientists is that a major flood occurred that reached over two miles above sea level. Only a global flood could do this. So this site is unique on Earth because it proves two important things. Our antediluvian ancestors were advanced in building and technology and that a global flood occurred. The gray stones that you're seeing in this picture are from 44 miles away. The weight of the huge foundation blocks, no one even knows.
The flood of Noah lines up with the evidence that we see in the world today. Scientific investigation has revealed over 1,800 oil well boreholes from four different continents have all been compiled and mapped. The newly emerging map tracks the thickness and extent of each rock type as they were laid down by the flood. This research reveals the same six mega sequences of each sedimentary rock deposit across multiple continents. Each mega sequence contains a huge stack of rock, often with coarse grain sandstone on the bottom, then finer grain deposits like shale, then topped by limestones. Each mega sequence is bounded above and below by flat eroded surfaces called unconformities. What has been discovered from both a creationist as well as from a secular understanding is that much of the continental fossil record was already in place before any of the present day ocean crust had come into existence. For example, all of the trilobite fossils had been deposited. Plus, all of the older coal deposits had already been formed before any of the present day ocean crust had formed. Since in creationist understanding, the presence of fossils is a completely trustworthy indicator of Noah's flood, this means that much of the flood damage had already unfolded and it generated fossil-bearing sediments on the continental surface before any of the present-day ocean floor had appeared. It further implies that all of today's ocean floor formed since the onset of the flood during roughly the latter half of the cataclysm. It also means that all of the pre-flood ocean floor plus the ocean floor formed during the earlier portion of the flood must have been recycled into the Earth's interior during the cataclysm. These considerations indicate in a compelling way that rapid plate tectonics must have been a major aspect of the year-long flood catastrophe. This six mega sequence worldwide flooding process perfectly set the stage for the subsequent ice age and the creation of a completely new seafloor of hot lava as a consequence. This caused an abnormal amount of evaporation and thus continuous rain that was likely worldwide. The volcanic activity that created the Ring of Fire would have spewed volumes of ash and aerosols high into the atmosphere, keeping the now frozen Earth in an ice age for hundreds of years to come. And sure enough, the first mega sequences rocks show a spike in volcanic activity and massive amounts of carbon dioxide. At this point, the newly formed continents drifted with great speeds, impacting one another, forming the mountains that we see in the world today. And, for the first time ever, new megasequence maps allow us to see how Noah's flood shaped our entire planet, just like the Bible said, including reconfiguring the continents. The Ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat on the seventh month of the seventeenth day of the month, and we now have evidence for this as well. We have discovered two amazing things. At the base of Mount Ararat, they discovered many drog stones. These gigantic stones are strewn about as though they were cut from the ship as the water receded. They are almost in a straight line pattern over eight miles approaching the mountains. What these are for is counterbalance for a ship during huge waves. When they discovered these, they wanted to actually put this to the test and see that if a ship which weighed as much and was shaped like the Ark, would it withstand massive tidal waves? The results showed perfect results that line up exactly with what we would expect if Noah's Ark was true.
Walker. As the ship would roll and pitch, this would swing back and forth and up a little bit as the ship would pitch and roll, similar to a shock absorber in your car. And it's, it's slowing down that momentum that would be created from that. So quite amazing that uh, Noah's Ark would use that kind of technology. The next amazing find is they found the cover that Noah placed over the Ark. As far as we know, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Nobody's ever... My goodness. It's got crosses uh, that are very faintly carved on it. You got, a big, you got a big one here. You got a small one right there. One here. You ever see, it looks like a little bit like pine bark. It sounds like metal. <laughs> this isn't an anchor stone. Oh, I see. At one point it says, and uh, Noah came out of the ark and he took the cover off, or he yeah. threw the cover off. This is a rather unique thing. It has the appearance and the texture of some kind of a bark. That is a cross. That is a cross. There you go. That is incredible. It has a very hollow sound. Very hollow. It sounds like metal. Noah's flood represents the single most detailed event to ever take place in the Bible. The Apostle Peter and Jesus himself referred to the flood as an actual event. Remember, when things die on land, they get eaten or degrade rather fast. The odds of life dying to make the quantity of oil that we find on Earth today is best explained by the flood. It's also safe to say that the fossil record is not valid when we find evidence of discrepancies in the record. And guess what? We do. The upside down geologic column in Pakistan is one such place. At the foot of the Karakul Ram Mountains in the Salt Range Formation, scientists have discovered fossilized plants and insects. From the evolutionary perspective, these remains belong to the upper part of the geological column. However, this formation lies beneath the Cambrian rock, which is dated back to over 400 million years. Discoveries such as these support the biblical version of the Earth's history, whereby the geological column is primarily a consequence of the global flood and its aftermath. It is no surprise that there is some order to the fossil record, such as sea creatures buried beneath land creatures and mobile creatures such as birds near the top. But, since as the salt range formation testifies, the ordered charge that adorn textbooks aren't always what they find in the field. Many results today have kicked evolution hard in the dirt. They have found complete stasis in the entire Pliocene era. We also know that the Ashley Phosphate Beds in North Carolina have found human bones and artifacts with dinosaurs together. Also remember that they also found modern day birds dating back in the Cambrian rock layers which supposedly evolved from dinosaurs. It's a total mess. Also consider that many of the biggest dinosaurs, such as the long-necked sauropods like Brachiosaurus, Titanosaurus, and Apatosaurus would have eaten colossal amounts of vegetation. So why do we not find such abundance of these plants in the rocks containing these dinosaur fossils? Take for example the Morrison Formation in Montana. Even though this formation had yielded many dinosaur fossils, they're very scarce in vegetation. This phenomenon of missing vegetation doesn't just apply to dinosaurs or their rock layers. The Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon has many animal trackways, but it's almost devoid of plants. These rocks tell us something profound about Earth's history. They suggest that these deposits laid down are not ecosystems buried over eons of time. Otherwise, we'd find more evidence as plants that the animals ate. Instead, the evidence fits nicely with the biblical model of early Earth's history whereas these animals were transported and buried catastrophically during Noah's Flood. Geologists have assumed and say that calm weather conditions are required for these settling processes to occur to form mudstone. Therefore, whenever they encounter mud deposits, they interpret them as forming in tranquil water environments. However, recent research published in the prestigious Journal of Science has turned this argument on its head. The researchers showed that mud deposits form from rapidly flowing water. Yet again, evolutionary theory fails when put to the test, and we have more evidence for a global flood. Evolutionary geologists claim that the Grand Canyon is the best and most complete geologic column on Earth. In the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ontario, Canada, 
there displays a massive diagram of the entire Grand Canyon, layer by layer. Within it shows huge breaks in time. 480 million years are missing between the basement and the Precambrian rocks. 330 million years are missing between the Uncar Nankawit and the Chuar Formation. Somehow came and left without a trace. While the supergroup was supposed to have sat there for some 215 million years, during which time it was tilted, it was then cut by the Tapit Sandstone. That 215 million years also left not a shred of evidence. Right here it's expected that there was 155 million years of deposition of dirt which somehow all vanished without a trace of evidence of erosion. The remains of the Surprise Canyon formation are supposed to represent 25 million years, again alleged to have eroded away while leaving behind no evidence. The top layer of Grand Canyon is claimed to be 270 million years old, and tourists now walk around on this layer. 270 million years of geological deposits have all been washed away. If we ignore Surprise Canyon formation, we still have a total of 1,295,000,000 years of alleged geologic time that has gone missing. This all adds up to a staggering 81% of the geologic column which is absent without a trace in what is described as surely the finest record of geological history anywhere on earth. Rock layers were originally laid down horizontal and in the case of the Grand Canyon supergroup they were tilted. Then they were cut off by erosion then more layers laid down on top of that horizontally. The rock layers do not conform as you can see in the picture. So they suggested, evolutionists, that millions of years of time between when the supergroup was cut and when the layers were deposited. But there is no evidence of this 215 million years. You can argue all you want, but where's the evidence? If all these rock layers were laid down over millions of years, then why is there mysteriously no sediments laid down during that 215 million years on top of the cut supergroup? That's a lot of years to leave no evidence. I mean, think about it just for a second. Scientific studies have shown that sediments and even dust particles accumulate at even as low as one millimeter per year. At that rate, in 215 million years, that would accumulate 215,000 meters. That's over 700,000 feet of dust, debris, and ecosystem remnants that should be visible. There is no accumulation of these sediments of the alleged 215 million years of time at the unconformity layer. It's not the sediments that are missing, it's the time that's missing. Those who argue in favor of deep time are arguing from an absence of evidence. This is the same problem which occurred with the moon. When they first went to the moon, they had expected to land in multiple feet of dust accumulation because they expected the moon to be very old according to their deep time belief. When they landed, there were only a few inches of dust, proving exactly the same thing we're looking at with the fossil record. Everything is young. The earth, the moon, and so is the Grand Canyon. More problems. If you look at flow number one in the chart, called the Cordinus Basalt, it was dated using Rubidium Strontium Isochron at 1.07 billion years old. Well, the other lava flow on top of it, flow number two in the chart, they found Native American pottery from a tribe that lived in that region between 1,000 and 1,200 years ago so they knew how old the lava was. But using the same dating method, the dates returned at 1.34 billion years old on lava that we know was only around 1,000 years old. Contrary to what mainstream science wants you to think and believe, the dating methods give vastly different answers on the exact same rocks tested. The Grand Canyon itself is far more of a depiction of Noah's Flood than it is uniformitarianism millions of years. 
The Empire Mountain Thrust Fault, just south of Tucson, Arizona, has Permian rocks on top of Cretaceous. What's especially interesting here is that the Cretaceous limestone is actually marble. It has undergone heating and pressure. It has changed its state because of this, and it's called metamorphosis. The Permian rocks have not experienced this heat and pressure, so this would actually indicate that the Cretaceous rocks are older than the Permian rocks. It further indicates that this out-of-order sequence is genuine. There is no overthrust here. As Burdick and Slusher documented back in 1969, no slick and slides, the Permian rocks had never been heated, and the rocks are locked together in what Burdick describes as a gear mesh fit. The rocks on the bottom were gouged out and then filled in with upper rocks. Obviously, the rocks did not slide relative to each other. So the rescuing device was that the rocks slid very slowly, and that that is why the rocks didn't heat up or melt. And people mention the San Andreas Fault in California as an example of this. Well, the San Andreas Fault is not an overthrust. It is rocks that are sliding beside each other. So again, the gear mesh interlocking of the layers show that there was no movement between the layers. They're locked together. And this is secular scientists that agree to this. This isn't some creationist propaganda. These are not overthrust. They again are genuine sequences of reversals of the evolutionary timescale. Regardless, there are far more problems with the geologic column around the world. What I have presented to you are examples after examples and evidence after evidence that there are layers that are out of sequence and order, evolutionary speaking, that there are hundreds of these in North America alone. And even if there was just one of these, it would invalidate the geologic column and ultimately evolutionary theory. And because there are far more than just one, it also invalidates the geologic history of Earth because these are supposed to be sequences of time. And if these are not sequences of time, they cannot use these for evidence of time. So in conclusion, these are not thrust faults. They are invalidations of the fictitious geologic column and deep time. I am astonished by the secular camp and the atheist who can see this evidence for themselves and deny it and then get mad at us for showing them that they were lied to and then they take the liar's side defending them. It is complete insanity. But let's move on, I digress. Here's the most recent refinement. I love this, by the way. The Geological Society of America has claimed to be able to date parts of the scale with an accuracy of 0.05% accuracy. <laughs> with such horrible precision, you shouldn't even question why they get dates wrong so often. Everything they feed the public is for the story they want to wield. They have no evidence. They make it up as they go along. There were at least six different skeletons found on the island of Guadalupe in the 1800s. These skeletons were of completely modern human beings found in rocks dated 25 million years old, according to evolution. Yet according to evolutionary theory, humans haven't been around for at least 100 to 200,000 years. So now you probably know why these skeletons are not on display. One of them was on display at the British Museum of National History for over 50 years. That was until evolutionary theory took hold. In total, they excavated over 30,000 different bones and remains from that rock layer, which is dated at around 25 million years old. And like all evidence that comes out against evolutionary theory, it's buried in the basement of a museum to never be seen or heard from again. Are we to believe that the High Arctic had an animal diversity as diverse as the Serengeti, yet was covered in ice and snow and going through an ice age? This is completely ridiculous. In 1924, the Doheny Scientific Expedition ventured into the Havasu Canyon region of the Grand Canyon. The expedition report, penned by Samuel Hubbard, is a short, 
but fascinating read. Now this short expedition brought multiple enigmas to the attention of the scientific community. One discovery of fossil footprints was only briefly mentioned in the report, saying that Mr. Gilmore was at a loss to explain these carboniferous footprints. That Mr. Gilmore was Charles W. Gilmore, who gave more detail in the Smithsonian Miscellaneous Collections. Mr. Gilmore showed the footprints which bore a clear resemblance of horse footprints to the local Native Americans to see what they would say about them. The local Native Indians considered them to be the tracks of a band of wild horses. Now I want you to remember, Indians were natural trackers and they could well identify any animal by its footprints as their hunt depended on it. I would think they know what a horse footprint looked like especially considering the fact that they owned and rode horses daily at this point. But the problem for evolutionism was that these footprints were out of place. They were in Permian rocks. The rocks were far too old, according to evolutionary theory. After all, many people still believe in the evolution of the horse. Although the sequence has been proven wrong years ago, it still appears in textbooks today. So I'm sure many listening still believe in this lie. But regardless, if you actually look at the charts, the first supposed ancestor of the horse supposedly had arisen 50 million years ago. But now, these fossil footprints in the Grand Canyon, identical to those of modern day horses, were in rocks that had been dated by evolutionists pushing 300 million years. Not only does this totally debunk horse evolution, but it puts modern horse way down at the bottom of the geologic time scale. Mr. Gilmore did the only thing he could have done, which was attempt to explain away the footprints as not even fossil footprints. A desperate rescue device. He tried to say that they were just stains in the rock. But decades later, the famous E.D. McKee visited the footprints, and called them footprints. He said it's ridiculous to not call them footprints, but he labeled them as an unidentified vertebrate animal, or just an animal with four legs. Native Americans specifically told them these are horse tracks and they belong to that animal. The answer was so glaringly obvious, but you see, evolutionary theory does not permit the glaringly obvious conclusion. Evolutionary theory is not science. It is anti-science, ruling out possibilities and discoveries before they are even made, and anything that is contradictory to it. These horse fossil footprints rule out the anti-science theology, which is evolutionism. So in closing, horses supposedly evolved around 50 to 60 million years ago, yet we find horse tracks deeper than we do dinosaur tracks in the geologic column in the Grand Canyon. But it gets better. The Doheny expedition also documented the fascinating petroglyph of what they even labeled as a dinosaur. Hubbard commented that the photograph of the dinosaur, petroglyph, had been shown to a scientist of report, who then remarked, It is not a dinosaur. It is impossible because we know that dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on the earth. <laughs> Gotta love how they know it's a fact, even though the very date that they quote in this is so far off by any evolutionist standard today. Now they tell people they know that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. Then when that date changes, the new one will be a fact. <laughs> How about some biological evidence? We have this as well. Let's take a look at the L, M, and M haplogroups. These directly correlate with Noah's three sons that were on the ark. You see, if evolution were true, we would have a plethora of different haplogroups in the diversity of humans today, not just three. This is evident when we look back in time at ancient man. We see tons of different haplogroups, but yet after the flood bottleneck, we only find three. Why is that? It's obvious. 
All humans today derive from the three sons of Noah, and genetics proves it today. But it goes much further than just this. There's evidence everywhere. If Noah's Ark is true, and the Ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, and the people from it spread, then Ham's line went to Africa, which has always had the fastest birth rates. Half the women give birth before the age of 18, even today. And because of this, we can make predictions based on their mitochondrial DNA. We're going to find out that young earth creationism is proven right yet again. Now, how about some of the typical complaints from the skeptic? Such as, what did Noah feed the animals on the ark? Where did they all go to the bathroom? Obviously, this would be a huge problem, would it not? Well, not really. The answer to this is quite simple, especially when we look at cold regions of the world like Sweden, where seven months out of the year, it's so cold that the animals move under people's homes just to stay warm. To combat this, people are trying to keep them out, but it's nearly impossible, so people eventually just start spreading out a thin layer of wood shavings and peat moss with straw. It's called deep litter. It works by absorbing waste for up to two years, requiring no cleanup whatsoever, and it also absorbs smell. One of the reasons why it works so good is by not removing the waste, good microbes come and make their homes in the litter, and these microbes actually eat and break down the feces and consume unhealthy bacteria, leaving good bacteria behind. As for the animals and eating, well, remember, these are small animals. They're very young. And they have to be, because how else could they repopulate the earth if they're old? They might not even want to reproduce. So having very young, small animals on a ship would require not very much food. Also consider, nearly all animals can fall into a hibernation state to survive extreme colds or famines. A lot of things that you've seen in this video are genuine sequences of reversals of the evolutionary timescale. They invalidate it. And these reversals of alleged time demonstrate that there is no deep time. If there is no deep time, then there is no evolution. So if the geological record actually shows clearly the flood of Noah, and if evolution is wrong about that, and the Bible is right about that, then what else is the Bible right about? You see, Jesus talked about the worldwide flood as a fact. And in fact, he cited the flood as a judgment from God and warned that in the last days it would be the same way, before the coming. And in the last days there would be a final warning, exactly the same as it was with Noah. For 120 years, Noah warned the people of earth of the judgment to come, and pointed to the ark, which was free salvation from the judgment to come. And Jesus warned us about the judgment to come. And Jesus is that salvation, and that kingdom is coming in the clouds and every eye shall see it, and it will be too late, just as it was in the days of Noah, as the ark was sealed. In 2014, a group of master students at Lesta University decided to settle the question. They used the biblical measurements to calculate the size of the ark, then they used the density of the water to figure buoyancy, and from there, determine how much weight the ship could endure before sinking. Their conclusion? Noah could have put 70,000 animals on board and the ship would have floated. And what do you know? It floats!